So I'm going to sort of broadly talk about three areas. Oh, hello, dog. Um, which is uh, a brief introduction about sort of trees and how they, uh, how they build soil. So building a bit on what Ben's just talked about more generally. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, integrating trees into farming, which is uh, sort of my passion at the moment. My background is commercial vegetable growing, but I'm much more interested in trees at the moment. Uh, I, think, I think they are, in my opinion, the the sort of the quickest, easiest win for climate and farming productivity. Uh, and we have a bit of a crisis that we need to try and tackle. Uh, and then I am going to talk about wood chip because I can't help it. Um, and, and it's a little bit uh, about, uh, it's a kick-starting of the process. Um, so Ben talked about the, you know, the sort of the biology and how we build soil and how we and how there's lots of things that we can do to that, and it takes time, but there are things we can do potentially to, uh, to kick-start it a bit. So, I'm going to start even before, even before you've got a tree, and I'm assuming that we're planting trees here, um, although this little oak seedling has... That, uh, anyway, uh, so that was uh, an oak seedling that had, that had self-seeded in my wood chip. But if you're starting with, with bare soil or with a field, the first thing you've got to ask yourself is, is that soil ready to grow a tree? Is it, you know, is it in the best heart that it will be? And, and almost going back to you know, how soil is formed. Um, so if you imagine maybe a volcano erupting and you end up with a big lava field and it's barren and it's bare, but it's incredibly fertile. But if you try growing a, a tree on it, it obviously wouldn't grow. What happens first is lichens and bacteria will colonise and they'll gradually sort of eat away at the rock and there'll be a bit of weathering and as they die they'll drop a bit of the organic matter. So, so as, they, as they die and they break down they, they deposit this organic material and then, and then slightly more complex things come in. So you get sort of very simple plants and annual plants and then as that all happens you get this building of soil. So that picture that Ben had of the fence post, you know, that happens over time, weathering. And, and animals, and, and gradually the soil gets thicker. And as that happens, it, it shifts from a bacterially dominated soil. So the bacteria is the stuff that comes in first. So you might have come across this term of the fungal bacterial ratio of soil, and, and it shifts over time. Now what happens as you go in and plough, or you cultivate, or you know, particularly if you spray fungicides, you're killing off the fungus in your soil. So you're damaging, you're reducing the amount of fungus, and you're shifting it back towards a more bacterially dominated soil, uh, which is not great for a lot of crops, but it's particularly not great for trees. Uh, so trees obviously particularly like fungal dominated soil. If you go into a forest, that's, you, know, you get that smell, it's a fungus. So if you're preparing a soil, particularly if it's a soil that's been arable or if it's a soil that you've been cultivating and digging a lot, then trying to do something before you plant it is, is quite a good idea. Um, in, in pastures or things that have been down for longer and already might have more of a, a fungal a population, then you probably don't need to worry too much. So when that tree starts to grow, what's the first thing that happens? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put down some roots. And typically, you know, a lot of trees will send down this really strong tap root. They'll go deep. They want to go deep and they want to anchor themselves. They want to get a good grip. And as Ben demonstrated, you know, a lot of the time these trees are pushing out a lot of their food that they produce, they're pushing it out into the roots to feed the soil. They want to feed all of these creatures around in their soil because then what happens, they can trade that sugar that they're making, they can trade it for other minerals that they can't get from the air. So there's this incredible trade around a plant's roots. I like to think of them as the sort of the ports of the soil, you know, it's where everything's coming in. The, the, the little creatures are coming in and they're trading their soil and they're getting sugar and then and all these minerals go back up into the tree. And as the tree grows, that trade increases. You know, a grass is only ever going to get, you know, a couple of feet high, whereas a tree is going to get, you know, many metres tall. It's got a big leaf area. As it grows, uh, you know, that, that uh, production of food into the soil and that trade is increasing. So the life around a tree root is huge. And if you then imagine you've got this massive group of trees, that's all doing it. And it's doing it for longer than some annual crop. So, so again, Ben's, Ben's point that he made about you know, the, the graph he showed of the solar 
energy and what we're capturing and what we're not. You know, wheat is really, well, annual wheat is really quite inefficient in making use of that. Trees are, are fantastic. They're in leaf for longer. They've got a much bigger area. They're tall. They capture all of that sunlight. So that's what's happening. It's building the soil. And it's building, so, so not only is it then uh, trees needing fungi in the soil, they also encourage and build fungi in the soil. Uh, so the more trees you've got, the more fungi they'll be supporting through that network. So it's a fantastic symbiotic relationship. So as they're building that soil, what, what's that doing for soil health? Why, why is that good? I mean, it's good for the tree, clearly, and having trees is good for, for the climate. But if we're farmers, uh, or you know, if we're growing things, we also need to understand that we, we want to be producing food under those trees. Otherwise, we'd just let the whole world go to forest, which would be lovely in some ways, but uh, probably wouldn't produce enough food. So thinking about what it's doing to soil health, it's, it's, uh, it's recycling those nutrients. So again, if you imagine with most plants, what you see above the ground is what is below the ground in roots. So, you know, a, a, a meadow with that much grass is going to have a similar depth of roots. If, you've, if you're growing your herbal lay up to two or three feet, that's what's going to be underneath. If you've got a tree that's 30 metres tall, you know, that root of mass is going to be under the ground. Um, and it's going to be pulling nutrients right from low down in the subsoil. You know, the tree roots are going to be going much deeper. They're going to be pulling those nutrients up, up into the leaves, the leaves drop. So all of that's building organic matter, it's building nutrients, it's recycling nutrients, it's recycling carbon. And it has an effect on water as well. Uh, this is uh, somewhere in the southwest, I believe. It's after maize, which hasn't been under sowed. So it's on a slope, it's harvested late, there's no protection, there's none of that armour that Ben talked about, heavy rains, and, and it just washes away. If we had trees across, across the, uh, the field, it would slow down. The tree roots will break through the soil. They'll break through often through compaction layers. They'll allow infiltration of water. So they can really help reduce these, this flooding. And you know, we know that we're getting these extremes of climate. We're getting you know, rain less frequently, but we're getting more of it when it comes. Um, and trees will really help uh, to, to mitigate the effect of those, those big rainstorms. But they're also, because they're building soil organic matter, as those leaves drop and we build the, the carbon in those top soil levels, we're, we're increasing a soil's ability to hold on to water. So, so you know, good soil will act like a sponge and when it rains, it'll soak it all up and gradually release it. So when it's, when it's really wet, it holds on to more, it allows more to infiltrate. But then as you get long dry periods, you're able to tap into those reserves within the soil for longer because of that sponge-like effect. The other thing that trees can do, apart from the amount of water, is they can actually improve the quality of water coming out. And obviously this is a big part of what we're talking about today. Um, there's lots of studies um, showing the ability of trees to reduce uh, pollution from, from water. So, phosphates, nitrates, particulates, you know, there are lots of different studies. There's a, uh, we did a book at the Soil Association called the Agroforestry Handbook, and there's quite a lot of the links to the, these studies within that. You can um, download that from our website. Unfortunately, no hard copies left. It was just too popular. Um, but this, this one particular study from France is sort of just shows nitrates, and it, that's a typical cropped um, agriculture system. Uh, with you know, a lot of leaching. That's a forestry where you would expect very little leaching of nitrogen, nitrates. And in agroforestry where you've got this mix of trees and farming, it's, you know, it's a bit more than the forestry, but it's really close uh, to that natural system and, and obviously much less than the, than the agricultural levels. So I talked a bit about uh, nutrients already. Um, in fact, I probably talked all about that slide earlier, so I'll skip on. Uh, this again, this is, this is UK. It's not just an out of focus um, photo. It's over in the east of England uh, on very light fen soils. Uh, and it's the wind and that is just soil blowing off into the hedge, into the watercourses. Uh, and some of you may have um, come across Stephen Briggs. 
uh, who's a pioneer over in Cambridgeshire growing apples and, and wheat system. Um, and his main motivation for planting trees was to slow the wind down. Um, so we know that, you know, typically wind speeds are much less uh, in between trees. They create these mi microclimates that can make crops more productive, but they also slow the wind down. So, you know, with more trees, you are losing less soil, you know, in, in heavy soils. So it's probably less of a problem down in this part of the world, I imagine, but, um, but you know. And what all this does is it brings resilience. And this is certainly with the, with the agroforestry system that I'm working with at Helen Browning's farm near Swindon. One of her main motivations for planting trees is a, about climate change and soil resilience. Um, so we have the, the bit of the farm we've started on, which is around 200 acres of heavy clay. Um, you know, we know that it's, it's a difficult soil to work. You know, so they've ended up not cropping it. For, for a number of years because it's so hard to get in and cultivate and get those windows of cultivation. With trees, we've already seen the soil drying out a bit. We've already seen the productivity of the grassland in between the trees go up. Um, so it's bringing, it's, it's giving your system the ability to cope with those extremes. It's also bringing, uh, you know, for those of you running businesses, it's bringing business resilience. Um, so we've now, you know, we're reducing our need for input fees because we're browsing some of the trees. We're, we're growing strange and novel crops for the UK, like almonds and, uh, you know, which, okay, they might not work, but who knows, in 10 years time, with that climate change, they might well be the only thing on the farm that's really producing a profit. Um, so the more enterprises you've got, the more resilient potentially your business is. The more complicated it is, but the more resilient it might also be. And this is a picture of a, uh, Ian Tollis farm where he's got horticulture, agroforestry, he's going rhubarb and daffodils in between. You know, he's got everything he's throwing at it. Not everything will work, uh, you know, but every year something will work. Um, and, it, and it's providing biodiversity, and, you know, which I haven't talked about so much, but is obviously a key part. So I'm sure a lot of you already know what agroforestry is, um, but broadly speaking, it's the deliberate integration of trees into farming. So over the last 100 plus years, we have tended to separate. We've become specialists in farming or in forestry. Uh, most farmers uh, will have some trees on their farm. Most farmers will not see those trees as a benefit or as useful. Uh, they'll see them as, at best, just something that happens over there. At worst, they're a cost and a hassle and things that get in the way uh, and they have to flail the hedges and they have to dry, drive around the tree in the field. Um, agroforestry is, is bringing those trees back into the planning of your farm and understanding the benefit that they might give to your soil, to your animals, to your crops. Um, and the, the broad principle of it um, is around, you know, a little bit as Ben was talking about, those free resources. It's about capturing and making the most of what's available to you as a farmer or a grower. Um, so we talked about that height, that sort of 3D farming thing where you're not just capturing it at that level and it's 3D in time. So you've got, you know, trees will be in leaf at slightly different time, uh, you know, to, to annual crops, for instance. And then you're also making much better use of your soil, you know, and soil, although it's not free in the sense that you've got to pay for it and own it, but once you've got it, it's a free resource. You want to be making the most of it. And if all you're doing is farming the top six inches uh, and, and not making the use of the extra, you know, depending on how deep your soil is, uh, the, you know, the extra few, few feet underneath, um, then you're not, you know, you're not exploiting the potential of your, of your farm or your land. And this is just a, an example of, of how that works uh, the other way around. So if you just have forests, the, the, the roots will grow out horizontally, uh, you know, and they'll go down, but they'll grow out horizontally. If you crop right from the start, that top zone, you're effectively getting that arable crop. You just push the roots down, so they take up the same amount of space, effectively, but they're just a bit lower. Um, and that, you know, so that's one, one example of how that works and there's a, there's a great picture as well where they actually excavated a tree and they showed you know the roots having done that and you know i mean this isn't an agroforestry talk so i won't go into all of it in detail but there's 
there's so many ways that you can integrate trees into farming. There's, there's sort of broadly speaking, we, they're sort of split into cropping systems and animal systems, although obviously you can mix the three on a rotation. Um, so silver arable is obviously you know, mixing it with large crops, silver horticultural. There's food forests um, you know, and, and forest gardening, uh, where, which is less commercial, but arguably more productive in terms of, in terms of calories. Um, what I'm interested in is how we bring some of those into, uh, you know, into commercial settings. So how can, we, how can we sort of keep some of the benefits and the principles of those really complex nature mimicking systems, uh, but still make them commercially viable, still have some efficiency in terms of machinery and labour. Um, it's, it's a little bit trickier integrating trees into cropping systems. It's, it, you have to sort of maintain some of that ability to crop. Uh, and the, inter the interface between the crop and the trees can sometimes be tricky to manage. I think with livestock, it's much easier. I think it's, it's a, almost a no-brainer that most livestock farmers would benefit from more trees or, or managing their trees, you know, for, better, for, for the better benefit of the animals. Um, and it could be things like, you know, just not trimming your hedges as much and allowing them to browse. It could be broadening your hedges to have wider shelter belts you know, more clumps of trees in the field. I mean, I know in this part of the world, you have a lot of trees anyway and a lot of hedges, um, you know, unlike some parts of the, the country where they, you know, almost denuded. I'm really interested in things like browsing blocks where you deliberately grow trees, which you bring your animals to, to eat, you know, so things like willow, poplar, mulberry, um, you know, so you grow them almost, allow the animals to coppice them themselves. Um, so there's, there's lots we don't know, um, but there's also a lot of this stuff is stuff that happened. You know, it's mimicking nature, it's mimicking the way that, that people farmed, and we've forgotten about the benefits. Um, you know, it's amazing to see what livestock, you know, what trees they'll eat and how they'll eat them. Um, so cows can have up to 55% of their diet can be browsed at certain times of year. We've forgotten that. We think they just eat grass or maybe a bit of grain. They love trees. You know, sheep even more and goats, well, can have 95% as browse. You know, so, so we sort of forget that trees are, are useful for animals and they've got high micronutrient levels so that they tend to be healthier. You have high tannins so they have less need for worming. So there's so many benefits that come from to animals from having more trees and of course having the animals as part of that system you know increases the the soil health as well um, so then the tree doesn't stop giving when it dies um, I, I went on a walk around one of the national trust properties and we were talking about ancient trees and and this sort of you know previous I think you go right stay chop it down you know now there's that much better understanding that they're just huge full of life even as they're dead and decay decaying and as they do that all of that goodness is going into the soil you know gradually it's being absorbed into those cycles of, oh. um, into the into the nutrient cycling the carbon cycling that, that is vital you know we've got to feed that we've got to feed the life in the soil Ben talked about not not having a day off from feeding the life in your soil and he's absolutely right and and trees will help to do that and this is sort of what brings me to, to the wood chip bit. Um, so, you know, we could just leave trees to lie down and gradually be absorbed, but we can, we can help, we can kickstart it, and we can do that by chipping wood, um, which obviously takes a little bit of energy to chip wood, but what we're effectively doing is we're breaking that wood, that trunk, into a small bit, which allow the fungus and the other life to get into it more quickly. So as a way of kickstarting your system, um, I think there's huge potential. Um, there's a, I, I'm just going to cover a couple of bits. Am I all right for time still? Yeah, yeah. I lost so much time with my tech nightmare. Um, I won't go into all of it, but there's just a few ways. So firstly, when you're planting trees, using wood chip mulches is, in my opinion, the only way to do it, pretty much, uh, in a way to build, to, to give the tree the best start. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that, but this, this particular picture is one of the reasons that I ended up writing a book on wood chips. So all of these trees you see in the picture were planted on the same day um, in the winter of 2017-18. Um, we pollarded a, a whole bunch of big willow near these trees 
threw the wood chip over the fence and I had meant to go back and move it and sort of mulch them properly, never got around to it. So these trees had about a two and a half foot mulch <laughs> of wood chip. Um, and the trees two meters away had a little sprinkling of wood chip. Um, and this was after, this picture was after three years. Um, so, and it was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, so, and it's, I think, mainly, if in this instance, it's about water retention. So there's, there's loads of evidence that a mulch, and a plastic mulch will hold, you know, will keep water in as well, but it doesn't do other things. Um, so it reduces generally a 10 to 15 centimetre deep wood chip mulch will increase your water moisture by back 25%. Um, I'm guessing that a two and a half foot mulch will do a little bit more than that. Um, so, so there's a real benefit just in terms of holding the water in, which obviously is great for tree establishment, but it's also good for soil life. You know, soil doesn't like being hot and dry, um, as uh, you know, Ben mentioned earlier with that temperature. And, and one thing that a mulch will do, it will modulate the temperature. It will, so most soil organisms don't like being really hot. They don't like being really cold. They like being 20, 25 degrees centigrade. Fungi will cope with slightly colder temperatures, bacteria will cope with slightly higher temperatures, but you don't want it to be really hot. Uh, you don't want it to be really dry and you don't want it to be really cold. So you know, a, a wood chip mulch will keep your soil cooler in, in hot weather and it will keep it warmer when it gets really cold. Uh, and there's, there's lots of scientific evidence behind that, but it also just makes sense. So you're, you're, you're buffering and protecting your soil with a mulch. As you can see, it's not very broken down wood chip. And this is from a pile that we put on a concrete base. So this is not on soil. So it's, it's uh, wood chip from tree surgeons that we get dumped on a concrete base. And already the worms are coming in. So these are just coming naturally. I haven't staged it and put the worm in. Um, so, and, and you sort of hear some of the people go, oh, don't put, don't put wood chip in your wormery because they hate it. That's not my experience. You know, this is really not very, composted wood chip and already it's got worms in. Once you start adding wood chip to the soil, you will see your worm populations increase. And again, you know, I've found scientific evidence to back that up, but I've noticed it um, in, my own, in my own experience. Um, and, and we've talked about fungi already. You know, wood chip is, is effectively giving a fungal boost to your soil. It's, it's providing an easily digestible uh, fungal food. Uh, in, uh, so you can either, you can use it as mulches for trees, but you can also spread it on your soil. Um, I would, if you're going to do that, I would either compost it first. So composted wood chip is fantastic, but you can also use what's called ramial wood chip, which is the wood chip from branches of less than seven centimetres in diameter. So it's young wood um, and it's got a much higher um, nitrogen component to carbon because it's got more bark. Uh, other nutrients as well, but nitrogen in this, in this instance is the key. So you can chip it and spread it fresh without having to compost it. So it makes it much more efficient. Um, and there's two really good studies. There's some um, uh, Canadian work that was done in the 80s. Uh, and then there was a project that was done by the Organic Research Centre about three years ago, um, where they looked at spreading rainwater wood chip on. And, there's loads more work that needs to be done on it, um, but, but the fear of that nitrogen lockup, which is sort of one of the reasons people get worried about using um, wood chip on soils, and there is, a, there is a risk, but with Ramiel wood chip, it seems to be very low risk. And one of the trial farms, who was a conventional arable farmer, was spreading Ramiel wood chip on his bare soil immediately before sowing his arable crops, and he saw no ill effect. Um, from doing that. So that wouldn't be how I would do it. I would tend to put it on a cover crop or a lay phase of the rotation if I was going to do it. But it was interesting that he, you know, he didn't see any harm. But lots more work needs to be done on the benefits of it. But, but one, of the, one of the reasons I like wood chip uh, as well as or instead of sort of green compost is it's a much longer lasting organic material. It's got these more complex lignins and things and they take longer to break down. So you're building your, your organic, longer lasting organic matter than you are potentially with a, with a green compost that breaks down very quickly. But I don't think it's an either or, but. Um, this is just quite interesting. It's not something that I'm suggesting you do particularly, but it, it shows a little bit about 
what wood chip might be doing in the soil. This is a picture from the States, um, which is a, a maize crop um, where they're growing it probably on quite badly looked after soil. So they were having a bit, and probably putting too much nitrogen fertilizer on, so they were having a big leaching problem with their, with their nitrogen fertilizer. Rather than uh, do some of the things that Ben talked about uh, and, and solve the problem upstream, they've decided to dig a huge pit, fill it with wood chip and capture the, the leaching coming off the field. Uh, and it works. You know, they reduce their pollution coming out of that system massively. And then every two or three years, they dig up all this very nice, rich material and use it as a compost and fill it with fresh wood chip. It's a slightly kind of crazy solution. But, but what, what it does show is the ability of wood chip to, to hold on to nitrogen. So if you've got, for instance, if you're using fresh manure, mixing it with wood chip is a really good way of making better use of those nutrients. If you've got livestock, using a wood chip bedding rather than a straw bedding will, will hold on to more of the nutrients. So there's, there's you know, studies showing reduced leaching from using wood chip in livestock bedding as opposed to straw. So it's got this real, real ability to sort of hold on to, to nitrogen and then gradually release it into your system. Um, and then finally, this is all just closing the circle. Um, so once you've got your lovely wood chip and you want more trees, you can actually propagate your trees in wood chip. And then it's all, you know, all part of using the whole... And then they're sort of ready primed with this fungal network around their roots. So quick shameless plugs. Uh, I do have copies to sell um, if you're interested. But also, um, if you're on Facebook, uh, I run a group called Wood Chip for Soil Health. Um, there's also an Agroforestry UK um, Facebook page. And there's also an American um, Facebook group called uh, Ramiel Woodchip, which is really good and has got a list of um, a lot of the literature um, on, on it. Thank you.